force inside of me is calling out for mega power, for mega grace. Come on, shout now to the Lord. I can bend my leg, I can get on my knees. And you, Jesus, I love what you've done for me. Amen. Amen. Come on. Now, now go back to where we started, 2 Kings. He said, listen, if I be a man of God. So he says these words, if I be a man of God. Let fire come from heaven now. Just like in about, you know, whatever, I think it was 400 and something, when uh, Patrick went and stood up and said, if I'm a man of God, remember that? And he went and, and uh, that somebody had died and they had buried him. And over his uh, grave, somebody said, oh man, this guy died. And Patrick went over to the grave and said, if I be a man of God, watch this. And he wrote the name Patrick on the grave. And the guy jumped out of the grave, was raised from the dead. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, look at someone say, if I'm a man of God. Come on, it's going to happen. Amen? So look over in Deuteronomy. I'm just going to hit a few verses, all right? Deuteronomy 33. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 33. And this is the blessing, he says, wherewith Moses, the man of God. Now, what did you just say? If I be a... Man of God. So here it says, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. So here it calls him the man of God. The man of God. The man of God, right? Go over to 1 Samuel chapter 9. In 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 9, the servant said to him, Behold now, there is in this city... Say it out loud, a what? A man of God. A man held in honor. All that he says comes true. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me here tonight. And all that he says comes to pass. Come on, somebody, right? So it says here, listen, there's a man of God in this city, and all he says comes to pass or comes true. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can show us where we should go. Now, if you know the story, they lost their donkeys. What do you do when you lose your donkeys? You know? <laughs> Go find a man of God. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, did you lose your donkeys? <laughs> Maybe a few people have lost their donkeys here tonight. Then Saul said to his servants, if we go, what shall we bring the man of God, so to speak, right? The bread in our sacks is gone and there's no gift for the man of God. What have we? And the servant replied, I have here a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. And formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he, he said, come and let us go to the seer. That's now called a prophet, was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, well done, come, let us go. And they went to the city where the man of God was. And they went to the hill of the city and they met the young maidens and they drew water and they said, is the seer here? And uh, he's just beyond you. And if you know the story, the man of God went and gave them exactly the details that they needed. So number one, what is a man of God? A man of God is to be one that is bold. I said a man of God or a woman of God, okay? M-O-G or a W-O-G, whichever one you are, all right? I can't help you there, all right? So, all right. So if you're a woman, say, I'm a woman of God. All right, if you're a man, say, I'm a man of God. Okay, so whichever one you are, what's the first thing we see in, in, in 1 Kings? Ah, a man of God is one that calls on heaven and something comes to pass. Come on. A man of God is one that calls on heaven and something happens. Something comes to pass. A man, what is a man of God? A man of God is one that speaks with boldness and functions in confidence. 
The reason many people do not function in this, in this is because they have no confidence because they don't know God. About a year ago, uh, Susie, and I, well, Susie and I have a little dog. And this is her favorite little dog. She would show you his picture right now if she was up here. <laughs> and this little dog, he's just a little thing, this little Yorkie. And she loves this little Yorkie, right? So about a year ago, we got a call. Uh, less, a little bit more than a year ago. It was in May, I guess. So a little over uh, 12 months ago. We got a call from a friend and they said, there's a, a stray dog that was found behind a, a building that was eating out of the trash. And they rescued this dog and he's got some Yorkie in him. You probably wouldn't be interested. Would you be interested in rescuing this dog? So, of course, my wife, she's got a soft heart. Ah, sure, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll do it, <laughs> you know. And so, so we went and we brought this dog home. Oh, my goodness, this dog. Woo. We love this little dog, too. His name is Jax. And so Jax is kind of learning how we play with our other dogs. So we had had this other dog, Jax, about two months. And uh, so we weren't quite sure about him. He wasn't quite sure about us. But one day, about two months after we had him, I was playing with the dogs. And so as I was playing with little Manny, he knew us from the time he was first born. And so I was kind of roughhousing with him. And I went to go do the same with the other dog, the former stray dog, Jax. And when I did, when I reached down, the dog rolled over on his back. And his eyes got big and he put his paws up like this and he trembled. And God spoke to me. And God said, that's how many in my church function. Because they don't know if God is good or if he's bad. They have no confidence in God. So because they have no confidence, they don't walk in boldness in their heavenly father. Come on somebody, amen. So there's no boldness because there is no confidence. So this dog had no idea if I was going to injure the dog because he had been abused before. So all he had known is abuse. And God began to speak to me through that dog as a result of that dog because I see that many times as Susie and I go and travel in hundreds of churches. We've ministered in over 1,200 churches in our 28 years of ministry. I mean, over 1,200 churches. That's a lot of people to look at on the lease. You know what I mean? And you know, you, you see a lot of people after 1,200 churches all over the world. And so uh, in 30 some different countries in 49 states, soon to be 49 states of the 50. And uh, so in, in all of this, <laughs> we see uh, uh, so many different people and they don't know whether God is good or whether God is bad. They ask you, will you pray? Do you think God will do something? No, I don't think. I always tell them, no, I don't think. I don't need to think. I don't reason. I'm not a Pharisee. I, th I don't think. I believe. Come on, amen? Come on, everyone say, I believe. I believe. Amen. I mean, I could tell you of hundreds of testimonies of, of where people were dramatically healed and people dying of diseases and stuff. I remember uh, we were in this church in Canada and we were ministering and we had this revival breakout in Canada. And uh, so we, we ended up ministering in that church for over a year. We were there for about 13 months ministering on and off and stuff as the revival just kept burning. And uh, so the one time we did a pool service. Whew, I thought the pastor was going to flip. And so we did a pool service and I told the people, bring all of the sick. I said, bring some hard ones. Don't, don't bring easy ones. Bring some hard cases. Yeah. Bring some dead people. It can't, they can't get any worse. <laughs> I, I went and I said, uh, I said, bring the worst of the worst cases. This woman says, listen, my next door neighbor is an atheist. She's been an atheist her whole life. She's never been to church. She doesn't even know what church, nothing of church. And she said, she, the woman is dying. And I said, what's, what's wrong with this woman? Well, she had multiple car accidents. She broke her spine, uh, depression. Uh, she's got cancer and all of these different things. So I said, bring her tomorrow. She'll be healed. She said, really? I said, absolutely. Tell her I guarantee she'll be healed. Now, who talks so crazy as that? I said, I guarantee her. Tell her I guarantee her. If she's not healed, I'm a false prophet. How about that one right there? 
So, and I said, and you can tell everybody in this city that I'm a false prophet. So they bring the woman to the meeting and uh, I, I'm, we're in worship. And so we're enjoying worship and stuff. And so I had to go to the back of the church to get something. And so as I went to the back of the church, the door opens and here's this lady bringing in her friend. And her friend was about 40 year old woman. And uh, she was walking with a walker. And this is, I'm not exaggerating. This is how long it took her to walk with the walker. Like this. Now the woman had not slept in seven years. So her eyes were swollen shut because she couldn't sleep, she couldn't sleep because the pain was so bad. She was on morphine. She had morphine drip for the pain was so excruciating in her spine. And so uh, I went and, and I said, uh, I, I see this woman. And she said, this is my friend I told you about, meaning this is the atheist lady, you know. And so I said, oh, I said, hey, it's great to meet you. I said, aren't you excited? And she said, what? Now this woman's in terrible pain now, right? She's excruciating pain. She said, I'm in so much pain. I said, that's wonderful. <laughs> she said, what? I said, no, this is great because this is going to be a great miracle tonight. I said, isn't it exciting that you don't get to take home your walker? She looked at me like I fell out of a bus or something. <laughs> Shook her head and... So, uh, so the service went on, and after the worship, then I got up and I preached. And I said, okay, now we're going to have the pool service. So I anointed the pool, and all these people came over and were lined up. And there was about 700 and some people in this church. And so they're all lined up. Now I see this woman come, and she's walking like this. And she's struggling. And it took her several minutes, but I'm giving instructions for the pool, and I see this woman struggling, and she's coming this way. And so as she's coming... Uh, she's crying because the pain is so bad. I said, sweetheart, you don't have to go through the pool. God will heal you right here. I just put my hand on her right there. I said, the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. Now, all of her skin had uh, um, uh, gone ashen gray. She was completely ashen gray. She has like a gray color. She had like no color in her skin, nothing. And here she was dying of cancer and she had a broken back right? The woman's dying big time. And so I just grab her. I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. So I took the walker. I threw it over the stage. I said, come on, go. And I released her and I let her go. And she was instantly healed just like that. <laughs> come on, somebody. Totally healed. She actually drove home from church. <laughs> come on. Amen. Hallelujah. If I be a man of God, come on, somebody. Amen. I mean, we went after those meetings kind of on a funny note. We had so many crutches. We used to always bring them home, right? So we would bring them home to our offices. So I stopped doing it after that trip because I had two, crutch, two crutches and I had the walker. And so we were standing in the airport in Detroit and we were going to get on the plane. And so the first announcement is, if anyone, you know, you're, you're handicapped and you need extra time to get down the jetway, you know, you can go first. So I'm standing there waiting, right? So I got the walker. I got the walker here, right? And I got, the, I got crutches under my arms. And so the lady's looking at me like I'm, you know, lame, you know? And so uh, she said, oh, sir, do you need help? She said, you can go on now. I said, oh, okay. I just picked it up and walked on out. She was like. <laughs> Everybody was shocked because here I am with walkers and crutches. And I just, it didn't even dawn on me till I got down on the plane what the world this woman was looking at me so crazy for. So we just leave them there in the church now. <laughs> Come on. Amen. Everyone say, if I be a man of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Uh, go to, uh, let's see, go over to 2 Kings again. 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm just going to read a few verses here in verse 8. And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, where there was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so that often as he passed by, he turned there to eat bread. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that you are a holy man of God. Come on somebody, right? You are a holy man of God, which passes by us continually. 
Let us make a little chamber, a little room, I pray, on the wall, and let us set for him a bed, a table, a stool, a candlestick, and it shall be that when he comes to us, he shall turn in there. And it fell on the day that he came there, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him, and he said to her, Say now to her, Behold, you've been careful for us with all this care. What shall be done for you? Would you be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered and said, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she has no child, and her husband's old. And he said to her, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, about this season, according to the time of life, you shall embrace a son. And she says, no, my Lord, man of God. What does she call him? Man of God. No man of God. Don't lie to your maidservant. And the woman conceived and bore a son in that season that Elijah had said unto her, according to the time of life. Come on. Amen. So when the man of God spoke, it happened. I said, the man of God spoke, it happened. We had a man who came to one of our meetings and his business was going bankrupt. He already had the papers in his hand. And he came to the service and we, we, he heard us teach on giving and stuff like that, just like Pastor Corvus just did. And, and so I just would teach on it and some of the people didn't like it in the church. And so usually when I feel the resistance, then I teach about three times longer. <laughs> you just have to put the pedal to the metal. Come on, somebody, all right? And so... Um, <clears throat> So I just kept on and kept on. And he had never heard that kind of teaching ever in his life. And so he came to me and Susie at the end of the service, he said, pray for my business. And uh, we, he said, I've already got the, the bankruptcy papers and there's nothing that can be done. And I said, no, I said, you watch. In three months, your business will grow 500%. I said, if it doesn't, I'm a false prophet. I'm not a man of God. And you can tell everyone about it. He went home and his business exploded. And all of a sudden, God began to bless him. Come on, somebody. On every single sign. And God so prospered this man. He bought up business after business after business. And this guy is a multi-millionaire today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. We as a man of God, we as women of God, we've got to start, stop being mamby-pamby. I said, we have to be bold. I said, we have to be bold. I said, we have to be bold. One time we, we, we had these meetings, we had these revival meetings, and uh, they asked us, will you, uh, uh, will you come to the pastor's lunch? I don't like going to those things most of the time. Oof. One is more religious than the other one. I think the one says, my demon is bigger than your demon. And just, whew, Jesus. So anyways, we went. And as we went, we, we sat with all these ministers. And this one said this. And then we were just about to eat. So the food came. So one of the ministers wanted to sound all pious and real holy and spiritual said, Brother Tom, would you please pray a little prayer over the meal? And I said, Brother, no, I won't. Because little prayers get little answers. I don't pray little prayers. I've retired forever from praying little prayers. I don't pray little prayers. Come on, tell someone, I don't pray little prayers. If you pray little prayers, then you always will get little answers. Come on. I only want to pray big prayers. Come on, somebody. And prophesy big things. Come on, right? Not little things. Hallelujah. If I be a man of God. I said, if I be a man of God. Come on, right? I mean, again and again, we see it through the scriptures. Go to 2 Chronicles 25, verse 7. But there came a man of God to him and said to him, O king, let not the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel to wit, the, all the children of Ephraim. But, uh, but if you will go, do it, and be strong for the battle. God will make you fall before the enemy, for God has no power to help and to cast down. Ammonias said to the man of God, but what shall we do for the hundred talents of which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. Come on, amen. 
Wherever Jesus went, he would constantly prophesy and speak as a man of God. You never say him say, well, let's just say a little prayer. Let's just say a little thing. Come on, somebody. But you always see him do grandiose and big things. Turn water into wine when they didn't need it. You know, because many people say, well, you only see miracles when they needed it. Well, what was the need? The Bible says they were already drunk. So what do you do with that scripture? You can put that one in your religious pipe and smoke it, huh? What do you do with that verse? I don't know what you do with that. I don't know. How about when he went and, you know, like he said, when he walked on water, there was no purpose. He would have passed by them all. There was no purpose, but he was walking and functioning, come on somebody, as a superman, as a man of God, wherever he went. Come on, hallelujah. So the miracle happens in boldness. It's not necessarily in the prayer, but it's in the boldness. That's where most of the miracles take place, right? Come on, disciples. Come on, disciples. So how is it going to happen for you when you're sitting in Wimpy and you see somebody who's deaf? Come on, amen? How's it going to happen when you are uh, in, in, in the pick and pay line and there's somebody who's lame, who cannot walk? Come on, somebody, right? Come on. We need to just start taking revival out. Come on. Let's just smoke it. Come on, amen? Come on. Just look at your neighbor and say, just do it. Say, just take the challenge. Amen? If I be a man of God, hallelujah. Go over to 2 Timothy. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 says this. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men will become lovers of their own selves. Now I'll just throw this out to you. Notice in verses 2 through 4 that you'll see three different times he calls people lovers. He said, number one, he said, men will become lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. I think we've been to this church, Susie, right here. <laughs> All right, traitors, heady, high-minded. Now watch this, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So he talks about three kinds of lovers there. This is just kind of FYI. Then it says, having a form. Now the word form is the Greek word facade. Having a facade of godliness, but denying the power thereof, come on, from such people turn away. For of this sort are they that creep into the houses and lead silly away captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come into the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so also do these who resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life. Now notice, he's speaking to them as a disciple now. Are you getting this? He's discipling them right here. Here's Paul discipling the young pastor Timothy who's discipling his congregation, okay? He says now, he says, you've fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, right? But continue in these things. Now watch this. Continue in these things which you have learned and which you've been assured of, knowing of whom that you have learned them. And that from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. Come on, somebody. Under good works. Come on, right? Thoroughly furnished. God, God creates something for us as men and women of God. What is it? Ah, it's the scriptures. The scriptures train us. Come on, right? What do they train us? Ah, they train us how to realize our access. 
that we have access. You've heard it hundreds and hundreds of times about the message of grace. And you've heard about the veil and beyond the veil and stepping through the cross. So the access that we have, that which has already been done and completed. Come on. And the greater we understand our access, the greater we'll begin to speak with boldness. Amen. Whenever you read Luke's Gospels, now uh, uh, Luke's writings, Luke was the only Gentile writer of the entire Bible. 66 books and only two of them written by a non-Jew. And Luke was the only one. So Luke, when he originally wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, they were one book. You look this up. This is nothing new, okay? So they were one book. They separated them. We called the one the Gospel according to Luke and the other the book of Acts. Now, whenever the Spirit moves in the Gospel of Luke or in the book of Acts, he always follows it with speaking. The Spirit moved and they spoke. The Spirit moved and they spoke, right? They were filled with the Spirit and they spoke. There's always a speaking element that Luke always wrote with, both in the Gospel of Luke as well as the, uh, the book of Acts. And so in the book of Acts, here it is. What did they have? They realized their, act, their access that they have. As a result, they speak with boldness. I mean, you read, uh, um, you read Acts chapter 4, and it says, and they perceived these men had been with Jesus. Because of the way they spoke. Come on, right? They did not speak as the scribes and the Pharisees. You look at it there in, in Acts chapter 4. Then as you get to the end of Acts chapter 4, persecution has hit the church. And you would think they would cry out, oh God, please shut off the persecution. And they prayed one thing, Lord, give us more boldness. <laughs> that we may... Speak your word. Come on, you look at it. Let's, let's go there. Let's go. Acts chapter 4. Look in Acts 4. All right? This is not in my notes, but this is, this is what God is speaking. See, Acts, uh, uh, excuse me, boldness has to be released. I said boldness must be released. Verse 29. And Lord, behold their threats. Now they're praying. Lord, behold their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness. Come on, everyone say it out loud. Boldness, they may what? Speak your word. There it is again. So boldness has to be something that's done. You don't have boldness to think. You have boldness to act. <laughs>